Hi, I'm Jimmy. In this video, we're going to look at Pepsi, ticker symbol PEP. First, we're going to run through the basics of Pepsi's business, how Pepsi stacks up to some of its competitors like, like Coca-Cola, and then we're going to see if we can come up with a fair value for Pepsi stock. And before we jump in, I just want to tell everybody about something new that I'm trying in this video and probably in some future videos as well. So since I'm sure that many of us recognize that uh, good stock analysis can be a matter of good research and, frankly, a matter of opinion. Well, with that in mind, I think it makes sense for us to include more opinions than just mine. So that's why I'm introducing now a series where I team up with other creators and we analyze the stock together. So Pepsi, our Pepsi analysis, is going to be the first video in that series. So the way this will work is I'm going to introduce you to a YouTuber. The one I'm working with today, his name is Ben Page. He runs a channel called Ben Page Investing. He's going to run you through the basics of Pepsi's business, what they do and how they stack up in their industry, specifically in this case against Coca-Cola. Then both him and I are going to use two different valuation methods to see if we can come up with a fair value for Pepsi stock. He's going to go first, then I'm going to use discount of free cash flow. And if you happen to run a finance-based YouTube channel and you want to team up with me to do one of these videos, well, you can email me at this email address. Now, depending on how many we get, we'll see how many videos we do like this in the, in the future. And if you're just a viewer of the video, please let me know in the comments below if you like this idea, if you think it works out well. Now, just so you know, my criteria for working with other creators is that they're trying to grow their YouTube channel. I don't care how big their channel is right now, but they're actively producing videos. And besides that, you just need to get your facts correct. I think it's, I don't care if we necessarily agree on what's a good company, what's a bad company, as long as we all do a good job of mapping out the facts and then presenting the information that is as objective as we can be. Because as Warren Buffett once said, you're right because your facts are right and your reasoning is right. That's the only thing that makes you right. And if your facts and reasoning are right, you don't have to worry about anybody else. Okay, that being said, here's Ben Page to talk about Pepsi's business. I'll be back when he's done to discuss their discounted cash flow. Hey everyone, hope you're well and thanks for joining me. And thank you also, Jimmy, for having me on. It has been great working with you. Now, today I just wanted to go over Pepsi and have a look to see if we can work out a rough value for Pepsi and if now is potentially a good time to pick up some shares in the company. So I know that you're probably aware of who Pepsi are and their general products, but I still wanted to first touch on how Pepsi actually make their money and the area that they're in as a whole. So overall, Pepsi breaks their operations into seven separate divisions and they consist of the following. First, we have Frito-Lay North America, and this includes their branded food and snack businesses in the United States and also in Canada. We then have Quaker Foods North America, which includes cereal, rice, pasta, and a few other branded food businesses and products within the United States and Canada as well. We then also have PepsiCo Beverage North America, which includes the beverage business in the United States and also Canada. We also have Latin America, which includes their beverages, food and snack businesses within Latin America. Then we have Europe, which believe it or not includes all of their beverages, foods and snack businesses within Europe. We have Africa, Middle East and South Asia, which includes all of their beverages, food and snack businesses within those areas. And then we also have the Australia and New Zealand and China region, which believe it or not, supplies their beverages, food and snack businesses in Asia Pacific, Australia, New Zealand and the China regions. Now we know that Pepsi makes fizzy drinks, but if we actually look over to their 2020 annual report, we can see that they do a lot more than just that. And the 2020 annual report is the latest that we can get hold of. And we can see just from that report that they have trademarks, including Cheetos, Mountain Dew, 7up, Snacker Jacks, and many more. So it's clear that they don't just make fizzy drinks. And looking at the same report, we can see that in 2020, beverages only made up 45% of sales for the company, with food sales taking up the remaining 55%. So Pepsi also used multiple different methods of restocking shops and suppliers, and that's what we're going to look at now. The main way that Pepsi actually look to supply is generally through direct to store, which is through Pepsi's bottlers and distributors delivering snacks and drinks directly to the store as and when needed. They do also offer an online system via third party and customer warehouses. This is enabling them to ensure that their products are always in stock as and when needed, and that they can also take advantage of any promotions or offers and anything like that that's currently running. So Pepsi produce their own products, 
They then use bottlers and distributors to send that out to stores so that people like you and I can go and grab a drink. Now, that all sounds well and good, but unfortunately there are some challenges for Pepsi potentially in the future. The first one of these would be the potential mindset change of customers that look to buy their products. In a world where everyone's looking to be healthier, live longer and be generally fitter, there may be a movement away from old school fizzy drinks and old school salty snacks. So that could affect the company's revenue and the products that they're able to sell. And secondly, the other one has been evidenced relatively recently by the impact of COVID. As we can tell, they provide a lot of their drinks and beverages and snacks to pubs, restaurants and places like that. And with the pandemic hitting and these places shutting down, that has essentially reduced the amount of products that they can sell because they can't sell sugary drinks to a pub that isn't selling drinks to the public. So now we know how Pepsi go about making their money. Let's look over to some of the key stats for the company. Pepsi currently have a market cap of around 197 billion, a PE ratio of 27.96, a diluted EPS of 5.12. Also, they have a price to book ratio of 14.68 and a current dividend yield of around 3%. Comparing this to Coca-Cola, one of their main competitors, Coca-Cola have a market cap of around 227 billion, a PE ratio of 29.50, a diluted EPS of 1.79, a price to book ratio of 11.79, and a dividend yield of also around 3%. If we move over to the finances for the company, we can see that Pepsi have had a relatively steady increase in revenue and net income over the last year. Net income itself grew by around 37% from June 2016 to September 2020. In 2020 alone, it grew by around 4%, and that includes the effects of the recent pandemic that we've had. If we look at the mapped chart of Pepsi's revenue, we can see that there is a gradual increase over the last five years, finishing at around 70 billion in 2020. If we compare this to Coca-Cola, who is one of Pepsi's main competitors, we can see that the ebbs and flow in Pepsi's revenue until 2016 quite closely matched the ups and downs of Coca-Cola, which would imply that these changes were mainly sector and market related as opposed to down to the individual companies themselves. However, as of 2016, we do see that they start to diverge with Coca-Cola slowly dropping off and Pepsi starting to increase. This also is the same for net income, where they followed the same sort of trend until 2016, at which point Pepsi started going up and Coca-Cola started going down. However, with net income, around the end of last year, they did start to meet back up to around the same sort of area. Taking a quick look at shareholder equity, we can see that there has been growth in shareholder equity, with it growing from around 11 million in 2017, up to a value of around 13 million in 2020. However, it is worth noting that shareholder equity did drop from 2019 to 2020. And if we take a further look back, starting at 2011, we can see that shareholder equity has actually been dropping since 2013, before it started to pick back up again in 2017. Now, overall, we can see from these figures alone that Pepsi pull in more revenue than one of their main competitors, and also a similar level of net income. And they allegedly have a plan to deal with the changing market environment. So Pepsi currently pay a dividend of 102 cents per share compared to the 42 cents per share that come from Coca-Cola. I'm going to run a quick analysis now just to see if we can come to a potential intrinsic value of the stock itself. And I'm sure that Jimmy will also be able to look into this using another method just so that you have an overall rounded view of the company. Moving over to undertaking the review for the company, what I'm going to use is the PE and EPS, and we're gonna chuck it all into a calculator that I've essentially made, and we'll see what it spits out. So starting off, I'm going to need the PE ratio, which is currently 27.96. Popping that into the calculator, we can move on to the EPS. The EPS sits at 5.12, and again, pop that into the calculator. We do also need a expected growth rate of the company. Now, this one can vary depending on what you think the company is going to do over the next few years. But for ease, I'm going to steal someone else's work and look at analyst reports, which set the company's growth rate at an estimated 9% over the next five years. So I'll take that 9%, assume it's correct, and pop that also into the calculator. For the rate of return, again, this one can kind of vary depending on what you want from the company. I'm going to use 10% for this example. But if you did want some more information on how to work out a potential rate of return that you would use for your analysis, 
I would suggest checking out Jimmy's discounted cash flow video because there's a section in there that covers it very, very well. So now that we've got all the figures plugged in, the calculator has spat out a projected intrinsic value for the company of $132 per share, which roughly is around where Pepsi is trading at for now. However, what is very important here is that we haven't yet applied any margin of safety to the company. So for me, I'm going to use a margin of safety of 10% but this can vary depending on what you want. A lot of people would suggest a margin of safety of 50%, which is a large portion and will greatly help you reduce risk, but is more likely to eliminate more companies for you to invest in. So if we pop the 10% into the calculator as our margin of safety, it now changes that the final figure for fair value is around $119 per share, which when we compare it to Pepsi's current trading price, shows that Pepsi is potentially overvalued at this precise moment of time. If we did use the normal suggested 50%, that would actually drop the fair value down to around $65 per share. Naturally, this is relatively personal to you. Besides the PE ratio and the EPS, which is relatively set depending on what time period you're looking at, the other figures are all down to you, depending on how much risk you want to take and how much return you want to get out of the company. So feel free to play around with the numbers to come up with a one that's more personal to you. But all I want to say now is that I'm off. Thank you so much for staying with me and watching this through. I greatly appreciate it. And I'm going to pass you over to Jimmy now. The last thing that I want to say is have a good one and remember to invest, save and subscribe. Okay, thanks a lot, Ben, for running through Pepsi's business. Now let's shift over to Pepsi's discounted cash flow. So first, I'm using uh, analyst free cash flow projections going out the next few years. Then I'm personally using a required rate of return of 7.5% and a perpetual growth rate of 2.5%. This gives us a fair value for Pepsi stock of about $134 per share, which is fairly close to what Ben came up with. Now, if you're not sure how to do this calculation, like Ben mentioned, I actually have a whole video where I talk about how to do this calculation, how to come up with the fair value, how to come up with free cash flow, required rate of return, all of that. I'll leave a link to that video in the description below. But one next thing we have to do for Pepsi is we have to account for Pepsi's debt. So if we adjust our DCF calculation, which adds, it accounts for you take debt, you subtract cash, and you adjust this. But because Pepsi has more debt than they have cash, well, that drops their fair value to about $108 per share. So for me, I'd like to see Pepsi drop below this price before I would consider getting involved in it. Beyond that, I think it's a very good company. I like the overall business, and I think it's impressive how they are growing relative to Coke. I just think we're going to need some sort of pullback for this stock to be worth it. Now, if you're curious how Ben used the price to earnings multiple to come up with a fair value for Pepsi stock, well, he actually did a video where he walked through the concept. It's a short six or seven minute video. So if you're curious, perhaps that's a good next video for you to watch. I got a link right here. I got a link in the description below. And thank you so much for sticking with us all the way to the end of the video. I'm very curious your opinion. So please, Leave your opinions in the comments below. Thank you so much, and I'll see you in the next video.